All right, welcome to Wise Up On Air. I'm Damian Kaspar, Software Product Manager here at Audio Kinetic. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We're excited to bring you a fascinating developer perspective today. Uh, we're going to be jumping in here in just a minute. And as we're doing that, let's get started with a few things about what's happening at Audio Kinetic. It's September already. Uh, sun is shining here in Seattle, but I'm anticipating the long dark stretching out ahead, uh, whew, soaking every minute of the sunshine that I can. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about wise to reality delivering a location-based audio system offsite. We've got a special guest here who we'll introduce here in a minute. And in case you haven't caught it, WISE is free for indies. Uh, we have changed our licensing structure and there are opportunities now for folks who are making smaller games, games with uh, less budget to really leverage these interactive audio tools, concepts, and uh, and really just start with all of the toys for your experience. Uh, it's not every game that needs these things, but when you arrive at a place during development where you have these explosions of ideas and you want to try and achieve those with sound, uh, Wise is there for you now uh, as an indie, as part of your smaller development, uh, as well of, as uh, at the core of your process and pipeline. So check that out. If you're building a small game, uh, you can check out our new licensing structure on that. And that brings me to something we've been talking about here uh, during 2022, and that's the forthcoming release of our next full version of WISE. Uh, this spring, we had a public preview where we brought you a new editing workflow as part of the next release, uh, asked you to put your hands on it and tell us how you how you got on with our our fresh take on tab based editing and editing workflow in Wise. So, ton of other features in the box there that we've been talking about this year, uh, and we also then brought you the public beta this summer, and that included our integrations with Unreal and Unity. Uh, and gave you a preview there of how we are uh, building those pipelines for developers working in those game engines. And we're still looking forward to that full release coming up this fall, and we'll keep you posted on when that's coming. Uh, but this is part of our commitment to carrying this to the community early and getting feedback. Uh, and I'm happy to say that We've received feedback that we've been able to put right back into the full release towards stabilization and just quality of life for folks. And so this process for us is, is super valuable. We're always listening here at Audio Kinetic, um, both to your feedback and to the great work you're doing. And so keep it coming. Uh, great to hear from folks. So speaking of that, we also have our next Wise Up On Air hands-on scheduled. Uh, this will be coming up on October 6th. We'll be talking with Audio Kinetic developer David Crooks about some of the CPU performance improvements that we're making as part of 22.1. So this will be a super deep dive for the heads who want to get like deep into like subframe accuracy and latency from a, from a core developer perspective. Uh, we hope you can join us for that. Uh, that will be coming up uh, again next week on October 6th, 3 p.m. Eastern time with David Crooks from Audio Kinetic here. And speaking of exciting live events, we'll be bringing back the WISE Worldwide Online Expo uh, to bring you into some of the cool things coming as part of 22.1. Uh, we've opened up registration for that so you can get notified when we put a date and time on the calendar. Uh, that'll be coming soon for you and you'll want to tune in for that. We have some surprises packed into that 
live stream event. Uh, this will be the third year of bringing this expo to you online. Uh, the first year, if you tuned in, I think we had an epic eight-hour live stream, and it was right at that moment when everyone stepped back into uh, this screen-based lifestyle. And uh, wow, uh, this year I'm happy to say we've honed that down to a much shorter program, and we'll be bringing that to you uh, along with developers here at Audio Kinetic to really present this picture of what we do here as part of a release. So. Get signed up for that announcement and keep them peeled across our socials, YouTube, and Twitch streams. And with that, I wanted to talk about conferences. Uh, we've been out in the community over this last year uh, at the Web Audio Conference and Develop Brighton, talking about WAPI, talking about Web Audio with WISE. And we're excited to be landing at AES in New York coming up uh, later in October, where we'll be co-hosting a hands-on workshop with the folks from Dolby working with Atmos in WISE to create immersive audio. So if you'll be in New York uh, as part of the AES conference, this is an a workshop that you can sign up to participate in, or we'll be going hands-on to bring you into that immersive authoring experience with WISE and Dolby Atmos. Uh, we also got Game SoundCon coming up right around the corner on the other side of the United States in Los Angeles. Uh, we've been hosting a room at the Biltmore as part of the Game Sound Conference for years now, bringing you a diverse uh, palette of different presentations, uh, introductions to WISE, introductions to interactive music, as well as advanced topics like optimizations and spatial audio, as well as our new object-based audio pipeline, which arrived in 21.1. So if you'll be in the area for that, we look forward to seeing you in person, uh, as well as the Game Developers Conference coming up in the spring. Uh, again, as we transition to this hybrid mode of online and in-person, we want to keep taking those steps with the community and continue to meet you where you are and where you're interested in talking more about interactive and game audio. So hope to see you out in the world soon, safely. Uh, and speaking of, I just came across this. Uh, there's a Develop Blue Dubrovnik coming up in uh, at the just a couple days here, uh, where Martin Stig Anderson will be talking about different music design approaches. And I'm always the first to line up when Martin is speaking. And I just wanted to surface this as an opportunity, maybe near you, uh, to really get a an expert perspective on authoring for interactive music and music design as, as a, a technique, as a skill from someone who, who really knows how to do that. So I hope everyone is finding a way to wade back into these things safely. And good luck, Martin. I look forward to hearing more about your talk in the future. So one thing we try to do here on Wise Up On Air is shine a light on someone in the community who's doing something cool. And I stumbled across uh, a video from Steve Babu who takes you through the process of building a gain plugin in Wise. And so I'm gonna spin just a minute or two of that here for you uh, so to give you a taste of that. plugin creation and then I can use the created effect plugin on a sound asset within WISE. I'm going to be making a gain plugin using Python and Visual Studio. Cool, so thanks for that Steve. Uh, we'll put a link to that into the chat here so that you can jump off and check that out uh, at your leisure. But this is also something that we have covered here on Wise Up On Air in the past. We went hands-on with several of the developers here at Audio Kinetic to create a plugin for Wise. And it's cool to see folks in the community 
reaching for this opportunity and taking their first steps towards creating something rich that they can use as a custom piece of their interactive audio. So if you're interested in digging deeper into creating plugins, check out Steve's video uh, as well as our two uh, episodes that go deep into a hands-on with creating a plugin for WISE. And that brings me to today. I'm so excited to get this conversation started and thankful to have my special guest today, uh, I'd like to welcome to Wise Up on Air, uh, Prezmik Danowski. Hey, Prezmik, how's it going? Hi. Shemik. Ah, great to have you. Thanks for hanging in there and uh, welcome. How's it, uh, how's it going? Hello. I'm doing great. Thank you. Great. And uh, so we're here to talk about From Wise to Reality, which is really bringing Wise into this real world environment that we're going to dig deeper into. But before we get started there, I know you have a rich history of interactive audio. Tell us a little bit about how we've arrived here today, kind of maybe touchstones of things that you've worked on in the past and um, yeah, get us, get us uh, introduced. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, my main job is um, being an educator so i work at the university of music in warsaw where i teach sound engineering sound design mainly in immersive and interactive environments so this is also my curriculum is built on my uh, artistic projects and works so this is why i not only teach but also work in the industry to get some uh, experience that I can share. So, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And that was slightly understated because, you know, some of the creative works that you've endeavored over time, I've taken a sampling of and, and like, take us a little deeper into that because I know you have a rich history of VR and especially with, uh, runtime VR in, uh, yeah, like weaving this sonic uh, fabric in these experiences. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I'm working with VR since 2016 when the first commercial uh, headsets uh, reached the market, but I was in love with VR since I was in the primary school. I guess it was since I watched in the cinema the movie called Lone Mower Man. <laughs> by, yeah, this one. <laughs> Classic, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was the moment that I fell in love with VR. It was so impressive. <laughs> yeah. And, and I was, I guess I was 14, 13, mm -hmm. uh, really young kid. But I thought that, yeah, this is, I, I always, I was uh, learning music. Yeah, I was uh, playing oboe and keyboards and saxophone. I was in music school. And when I saw VR, I thought that this is the instrument of the future. Yeah. yeah. This is how we're going to play music someday. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And that is really where you took it, because I know in one of your recent VR experiences, there is that performative yeah. aspect to it. Yeah. So I parked that idea then and waited until the, the equipment will be available. Uh, so and actually, I forgot about that. And when I saw the first demo of the Oculus uh, development kit, I just, you know, it was like bling. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. This is my old love. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And and you jumped in uh yeah. with I just it was it was deep dive. Yeah. Yeah. Since the day one. Well and we'll hear more about how that arrives in the project here for the Expo twenty twenty two uh in Dubai. Is there anything else you want to say about your experience with, you know, real-time audio for VR or 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 interactive? Well, the my my focus on VR 
also uh, brought me to the spatial audio topic. Yeah, uh, which is much wider than on not only VR, but but there is a lot about spatial audio, and that uh, was a very great tool to work with when I arrived at the Expo project because uh, it. Uh, we thought about using multiple speakers yeah. at the special projection room. So uh, that was really a uh, good base to start with, to think about, is it going to be spatial audio? Is it going to be ambisonics, multi-channel? How we can approach that yeah. from, this, uh, from this side? So uh, yeah, uh, VR brought me with, uh, gave me many tools work with not only in the uh, simulated environments but also in the real environments because of spatial audio right and this is a, a long passion for you now you're uh, just finishing up with uh, your your doctor's thesis and yeah. so a lifelong pursuit and passion for for sound and so uh, I'm excited to arrive here today and and leverage your experience talking about how that all arrives as part of this uh, in-person realization of of this experience. Uh, let's jump in. Yeah. yeah, let's do it. So when I was invited to the project, yeah, what you can see right now is the uh, the Polish pavilion. Uh, this is a photo, not the render. So this is the Polish pavilion in the uh, the venue, the expo in Dubai. Uh, and I was invited in the moment that we had already there was also already a team uh, designing uh, projections for a special room with screens, and there were composers already invited to compose music for the projections. But we had, there was no uh, tool that will connect those two words. So the projection was interactive and it was uh, browser based. Uh, it was created with special uh, notes, uh, JS engine uh, by variable company, uh, by Martin Ignatz. So this was a bespoke uh, environment to create visuals. And on the other hand, we had the two composers composing music. One was making more or orchestral cinematic type of music. And the second was uh, creating uh, music with modular synths. And uh, the, the composer from the classical standpoint was Tomasz Opałka and the syn synths, analog synths was Mirt. So those were also two different words, uh, music-wise. So uh, the whole idea was to, how to connect those elements in, in this uh, whole project. And there was also a project of architectonical project of this room, of this space. So this was a reference, how it's, go how it's gonna look. And this is a preview uh, design preview of this space. So we had two big screens and a sound system that was also not uh, common, commonly used because we had some speakers above those screens and there was a ring. Uh, I can show this ring. Maybe on the next slide it will be uh, more clear. Yeah, this is cool. Yeah. Here you can see uh, there was a room, big screens, 40 meters long, I guess, one and the other was nine meters, I guess, uh, very wide uh, and with strange uh, projection <laughs> format also. Yeah, So we had those three speakers above one uh, screen and three speakers above uh, the second screen. And also here you have this ring with speakers those boxes are the uh, pro video projectors uh, yeah video projectors yeah and these are speakers so you had this ring with <laughs> tilted speakers and what uh, what was uh, surprising for me was that there was not i i didn't uh, had a connection 
to individual channels at this speaker ring. This was just uh, split in two channels. So five speakers were for the left and five for the right. So that complicated things a bit. Yeah, and you didn't have a lot of input at this stage yeah. of arranging the hardware. But again, what yeah. you're talking about today is pulling that, pulling all of these pieces together into the best representation across uh, yes. different composers, across the different environments uh, that are represented on the screens, uh, and across the the physical location that they were building. Uh, to present this in and so it's it but quite non-standard this is not uh this is not a yeah. home theater uh -huh. this is not a uh yeah this is not a standard playback configuration yeah so one fortunate thing was that the compositions weren't ready at that point so we could have a session with composers where i could learn uh, teach them about uh how wise works how interactive music can work what we can achieve with that because uh beside the uh, projections we had also a uh, possibility of interactions so as you can right. see at this slide we have those rings on the floor and these were uh, connected with the sensors uh, here we can see the sensor above so these were connected to sensors and those interactions made by uh the the audience the people that would stand in those uh, rings these would interact with the image or with the sound we were planning at that stage what will happen right we had just the possibility right so it's so, yeah, not so, just leveraging yeah. the dynamic music or you know randomization opportunities for the soundtrack but also triggering other pieces of sound to play back when folks would step into those zones of interactivity. Yes. Yes. So uh, this is why we had this session with composers. Uh, we are talking what we can achieve using WISE in this uh, situation, because of course, at the first meeting, I said that if we want to connect those, this bespoke uh, visual system, with an audio system, we should use WISE because we can communicate using a uh, protocol and we used WebSockets. So WISE authoring uh, application uh, supports uh, WebSockets connection. So this was a, a option for us to, to use that. And it worked perfectly in, uh, nice. at the end. So yeah. And so that's a browser-based tool that they're using to... Yeah. Uh, to manage all of the visual aspects that you then yeah. ended up posting events to WISE running on a PC in the space. Yes, we did a bespoke integration of WISE API with uh, the, the uh, visual system. So, yeah, it was using WebSockets. Worked really well without any problems. Nice. So uh, the one thing was that we didn't use the uh, sound banks, but we just use and we we didn't have an application for sound. We just use the uh, authoring application for that. Yeah, but it was stable. There was no problem with that. Awesome. Well, so that was the first. Um, the first thing was that you're tying together is the the visual playback system and audio playback yeah. with Wise. So from there, you've, you've got this, uh, this in place, but, but now that's the simplification. So yeah. how are you getting sound from WISE to this wild array of speakers? Yeah, maybe before ah. that, I would like to talk about this uh, moment when we, uh, when we found out the method that we want to use, yeah. uh, but we didn't have access to the venue. So that, that was a big problem, right? You know? Because the venue was uh, uh, still in the construction yeah. when we started to, to work on the content. So yes, one, one way would be to recreate this venue at our place. 
but it would be very costly and uh, difficult to yeah to achieve. So yeah, uh, so I propose to create a virtual uh, duplicate of the venue and use the virtual reality tools and game engine to recreate that uh, in the in the virtual world and. So we can fill the space, fill the, uh, the elements, how they are built, how, how do you feel with the screens, how are, how are your spatial relations to this uh, system, this audiovisual system, because it's important if you are watching the video from one meter or from three meters, and if you are listening to the speakers close or, or far, uh, you'll never know until you get there. So fortunately, uh, I was able to create such uh, system using Unreal Engine. And the idea was to build this uh, in a way that once we get there with the content, we can just swap the virtual counterpart with the actual system that is on the site. And uh, yeah, well, so and it's it's partially a pre visualization tool. So it's a, something that you can bring the team together to begin to understand some of the challenges that you'll face when you arrive on site. But it's also a way for for them to, you know, understand what the delivery of what they're working on will be and how that will arrive spatially in the space yeah. so yeah. yeah but we also uh, wanted to see for example those screen projectors in the full uh, size because this is totally different if you see something on the 16 by 9 typical screen and comparing to that and uh, that was one way one, one thing so we could project that on those virtual screens using NDI protocol so actually, that was a real-time projection on those virtual screens. Cool. And sa same with sound. I could achieve spatial simulation of the reflections because uh, those screens have, have a shape that is uh, not great for sound projection <laughs> because you have those waves uh, uh, gathered by those... Uh, uh, this 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 shape of the screen. So, I was wondering if this will uh, just collapse in one place <laughs> and sound awfully. So, using spatial uh, simulation of the sound, of course, uh, from the wise spatial uh, audio system, I was able to achieve some uh, reference how it would sound standing close to, closer to the screen or being far, uh, um, for example, in the middle. So I could place those sounds on in the positions of those speakers and simulate the, the sound projection. Awesome. Yeah, so I just wanted to show you just a glimpse of the, of the uh, system that I built. Uh, and the, the actual system was in VR, but I will not present it in VR because it would be difficult right now. Sure. So I will show only the early desktop version, which was sent to the composers because they didn't have the headsets. Great. So we use that so they can feel a little bit uh, how the space looks. So yeah, let me just start that. And yeah, I'm gonna run the model. And you will be able to hear the sounds, hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully, when I will activate the, um, uh, this uh, those uh, spots on the floor. Great. Well, and I love this as a tool to help bring the team together, right? It's yeah, it it was wonderful, and it was a great tool for presentation to the client. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Great. Sounds good. Yeah, so this is one of the compositions by Mir, and you can hear that now I am activating each of the spot on the floor, it uh, is activating sound in the speaker here above me. Right? 
So we could see there is no uh, animation yet projected on the screens because it wasn't ready at the moment to build that application. But I, I can show you a video from the later stage how that looked when I was using. Uh, sorry, I just left <laughs> fire shot <laughs> yeah. for some reason there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let me show you uh, the video from the later stage. Um, for example, here, uh, yeah, maybe that's gonna be it. Yeah. Hello, I wanted to present. I will just mute it for a moment because I'm talking there because we use also videos, recorded videos for communicating. We did it all, all of that almost all of that online without meetings because it was pandemic yeah. and we were working from different studios but you, as you can see you have the projection of the animation already on the screens here yeah and i'm jumping on those active uh, spots and at this stage i will stop just it in this moment at this stage those spots were connected already to the websockets uh, uh, client which was communicating with WebSocket server that I, I did just a dummy uh, WebSocket ser uh, server in Python. So we can see that they are corresponding here and uh, the server is receiving true or false message from each sensor. And then we just could swap that with wise and uh, proper events yeah. that will activate or disactivate. Uh, disable uh the uh, sounds from those sensors right that's great so you can see yeah so you can see that the whole approach was to get as much as possible without doing additional job uh so doing this vr uh environment wasn't our actual job <laughs> but we needed that to be safe when we will arrive in uh, in the uh, Dubai, because we had probably a week to deploy everything yeah. in the place, so so we this gave us opportunity to test many things, and also as I said, presentations for the client, which was the Polish Investment and Trade Agency. Yeah, this is a government agency, and people are used to meet in the meeting rooms <laughs> yeah. with chairs and tables and how can you present <laughs> for example that big installation right yeah so you can show this on your notebook but it would work like that so we use the vr we brought the vr uh, headset uh it was totally different yeah uh experience for them so yeah that helped us to uh talk with them what they want to achieve and what we can achieve yeah it was really worthwhile to do this simulation and uh, environment yeah well and as you were saying you you have this time in advance before you land in the in the space when it's completed or close to uh to done and the more you can do there to align people's expectations with how that's going to uh, arrive, how it's going to sound, how it's going to look, how it's going to interact. Uh, the more you yeah. can do to align people to that, you know, it maximizes your time when you are in the location yeah. because there's no questions. People are already, they already understand, you know, decisions that have been made up front and potential scenarios that will have to be flexible yeah. because of yeah. the space. Well, this approach uh, was really, I was really impressed when I came to the venue and uh, and I felt that I was already there before. Yeah. So it was like that, yeah. Yeah. It was just like the same site. And fortunately we received the, the model of the space from the architects so just uh, the importing that to the gaming engine was really very simple wow uh, we use yeah yeah well because they did all the all the modeling work so it was just like uh, import and and that's it yeah and use it well then i love how our different disciplines have that 
ability uh, that you could take an architectural mock-up and import it into a game engine and that you could yeah. translate that uh, into this workflow uh, remotely so that everyone could understand and align on what what was happening uh, that's uh, yeah. so rich it, it it felt like uh, the future everybody is talking right now about metaverse and we just were working using metaverse <laughs> on that project <laughs> cool yeah. cool <laughs> yeah so the uh, one uh, thing that was uh, surprising for me was the moment when the, um, the joint venture that was doing this project as a, a producer they said yeah we have money to record a real orchestra and use it because at first uh, there was an idea to use uh, virtual instruments right. for the orchestral part. But then they said, yeah, we want to do it. We have partnership with Philharmonics in Szczecin and we can record that uh, and have better quality. So that was the point when I asked myself, yeah, so how do I use that orchestral material in such way that I can expose every virtue of that using this uh, sound system. Right. So yeah, so I was, uh, let's go to this slide with, yeah. So I was thinking about using a uh, mixed approach. Uh, during my research, I found out that there are many ways to record spatial audio, not only ambisonics or, uh or uh multi-channel but you can mix those together or uh you can specialize object sounds recorded with the spot microphones so yeah so i thought that i should do it two ways one was the multi-channel recording with system that you can see on the screen right now so this is a 3d Cubes microphone system yeah. with uh, additional uh, X, Y per uh, stereo per in the middle, mm -hmm. just to capture more of the center of the scene. And uh, the second approach was just to use spot microphones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I could have different possibility to render the sound in different ways on this uh, strange sound uh, speaker system right uh yeah because i didn't know how how regular this system will be for example those three speakers above the screen on one side and on the other they were potentially something they could use to decode ambisonics but i wasn't sure if that will sound well because of the, how the speakers will sound, how the reflections will work from the screen. So just in case I did the AV recording and the spot mics also on the uh, uh, band. And the second question was, should I have all this as a single performance by whole band or should I just pick some parts and have option to manipulate with that? And the second approach was, of course, the answer because we we didn't knew how much of interactivity we will want to use because uh, through, our, through our tests, we found out that the walk through this environment will be quite quick by people. Yeah, there will be many people going through this place. They will stay there, for example, for a minute maybe two minutes but the, uh, probably they will go through it with a slow walk so how much time do you have for interaction in this kind of an environment and what are the yeah, yeah and if there's that, that a, was, if there's a lot of people flowing through that space too yeah, re-triggering yeah. and uh and so yeah but these are the considerations as you're preparing to do this recording because you want to have you want to have what you need when you arrive yeah. on site to be able to, you know, uh, yes. shape it in the best way. Yeah. So uh, I took the score of those pieces and I just chopped it into smaller parts. 
Uh, this wasn't done by the sections, but rather the music sections of the piece. So, sure. for example, I, I, if the trumpets and violins were playing together the same phrase, I recorded them together and not violins and trumpets separately. Right. So this was like more in a musical way. Uh, the sections were m more musical than the technical, I guess. Well, so and you started to, yeah. because you know interactive music, you know, from a, from a game perspective, uh, you were able to see how you might arrive within the wise interactive music system and start to dynamically combine these different yeah. stems or layers. Yes. Yes. So, uh, the great thing about wise is that I could connect those pieces together in the engine. Yeah. I didn't need to, uh, and didn't have to do it in, uh, workstation. Right. I just could use that directly in Wise, so this was great, and yeah, actually uh, this happened. So uh, here is the the uh, uh, my session with those pieces. Great, and so the, and that yeah. that environment was uh, it had, if I remember, you know, different environments. Uh, pulled from the landscape of Poland and represented yeah. visually on the screen. What were those different environments? Yeah. So there were, there were five scenarios. One scenario was about Polish mountaineers, mm -hmm. which are very renowned in the world. Uh, they are first achieving some uh, uh, mountains in the Himalaya mm -hmm. and so on. So uh, there was a scenario about how they learn to climb in Polish mountains, Tatra, and then they go to the, the uh, Himalayas. So this was one scenario of those mountains. Great. Uh, the second scenario was about uh, Polish scientists that are working on the theories about uh, space. So that was more abstract and with some nice visualizations of uh, um, outer space and how, for example, the F, uh, the, the, the uh, black hole is yeah. shaping the uh, light. So yeah, this was really a nice scenario, visually. Uh, one more scenario was about digital culture and especially about Polish game developers because we have a lot of famous game developers in Poland, especially CD Projekt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but there are many companies and our uh, game developers are doing a great job. So there was this scenario and this scenario was uh, designed as a game itself. <laughs> yeah. So people could interact with those spots on the floor and just uh, uh, hit the blocks that were appearing on the on the screen. And uh, yeah. so this scenario was tricky because uh, we actually didn't know how long someone will play the game. So we had to do the looping and interactive music. And if you won, then it was the ending sequence. Uh, of course, there was some time limits for that, but it was uh, uh, it could be random. Yeah. Uh, at each yeah. Fun. And one fourth scenario was about um, changes in our country. So this was a visual representation of the pole map of Poland. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, just uh, changing and changing shapes and so on. So this was the reach with the music. There was a big band, uh, big ensemble playing for that with brass and so on. I will show you that later. And the last, I guess, I think one of my favorite scenarios was about Polish forests. Right. So that was composed only from the sounds from the uh, Polish uh, forests, animals, environment. And we did this environment that you could feel that you are immersed in the woods, in the forest, you could feel that. 
And especially in the context of city in the, that is built in the desert, that was really uh, intense experience when you felt this humidity in the air, the, the smell, oh, you could all almost smell the Polish woods being there. Yeah. And the sound, yeah, the sounds of the environment were so uh, new to some people, the, the people from uh, Emirates and different parts of the world, that it was really interesting for them. Something that we are very used to it. Uh, that was something new for, for uh, many people there. So it was interesting. Yeah, so it's bringing that immersive experience from a culture and you know putting it, in this case, in the desert and having that accessibility for people to immerse themselves in the soundscape, in the landscape of Poland and experience that multi-sensory immersion uh, you know, and and bring that kind of dynamics to it, both uh, with the variations uh, musically and sound that we're used to from an interactive audio standpoint, uh, but also in this space with this rich experience, yeah, really uh, brings people into that feeling and and a and striking striking experience yeah yeah the visuals were like uh, animated diorama of woods so you could just stand there or some people even light on the floor and just listen to it so yeah that was uh, really interesting and we had this uh, uh, change of time of day during this uh, short presentation so you could start in the woods in the night and finish that in the morning, so you could feel how the, the uh, there is this dawn uh, and the change of light, and of course we did the in interactive sound, so the time of day change also yeah. with the sounds. Nice, and again bringing your experience with, you know, interactive audio, time of day systems in a game, super common, right? But maybe yeah, not, yeah, of course. But maybe not for uh, for the people who were imagining this experience. But you know, an easy contribution for sound to be yeah. able to to work dynamically in that way. Of course, of course, yeah. Great. So we did five scenarios. Two were with the uh, modular synth music. Mm -hmm. uh, two were with the orchestral music, and one was just the sounds of nature. Great. And those uh, those compositions were also hybrid, so a little bit of modular, a little bit of yeah. orchestral, so combining yeah. those elements. And again, like you're bringing together these different compositional worlds uh, with your use of wise, you know, bringing in stems from uh, from the composer working electronically, bringing in stems from your recordings uh, with the orchestral, uh, and all of it kind of landing in wise where you have these opportunities to, to orchestrate it. Yeah. So the challenge when, when we finally got uh, there uh, in the Polish pavilion, the challenge was uh, to see how it will work in this, the real uh, sound system. So, uh, yeah, and it worked really bad at the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> I was terrified that this sounds like uh, from a can or something like that. Yeah. So um, I at first I tried the approach with the ambisonic decoding. So I tried to use this. Uh, 3D cube system recording to render it on those uh, six speakers and use uh, this middle ring for additional effects. But unfortunately, uh, the speaker system was working well, uh, but only when you had this sound spread around it and 
uh, when you had those sections uh, from the from the recording from the front of the stage of the scene, it just disappeared somehow. The sound was not so full. So uh, I was thinking, scratching my head, how can I manage that? And at the, at one moment, I I uh, remembered that. I was on a meeting uh, with people that were talking about acousmatic music. Uh, and acousmatics is a, a word from the French electroacoustic music. And uh, this is a term describing the method of playing electroacoustic music where each speaker is a separate instrument and they are placed on the stage. So I uh, taught myself that maybe this approach will work. So I can use different speakers for different sections and play the sounds through them. And when I, I, I was, of course, mixing that using uh, the, the system at the venue. So I, uh, I stayed overnight because <laughs> during the day there were a lot of people finishing construction and, and my, uh, finishing the exhibition uh, spaces. So I stayed overnight and I started mixing using that yeah. way. And then it st started to sound right. Well, then it's, so, it's that yeah. abstraction, right? Because you arrive in the yeah. space, you are now faced with the exact physical constraints as well as the constraints of your playback system. And as you mentioned, you have the three sets of speakers on each, on the at the top of each screen and then you have that circle of 12 but they're not you know that's not uh, 12 uniquely addressable speakers i think you were saying so you have to find the best presentation of the audio for that space and ultimately it sounds like the only way to do that was in the space with some yeah. time yeah yeah well, I could simulate some of that using this VR model, yeah. but actually I didn't have much time to do it after the orchestral recording. Sure. So I didn't have time to do the mixing in the virtual environment. I just hoped for the best going there, you having those different kinds of materials. Yeah. Uh, but you arrived with all of these different pieces yeah. in your in yeah. your kit to be able to shape that result in the space yeah. in the best way possible. And again, it's a good thing that you imagine different ways of playing this back and then took a step into abstraction because the expectation that it be, um, you know, a literal orchestral representation, left, right, center, or, you know, a surround representation, like, as you said, that that didn't work. So you took a step out of that and just started placing these elements in the space in a way that sounded right. And I think that's a, that's a smart improvisational choice. Yeah, having options is always crucial <laughs> yeah. to, to, to cope with some uh, limitations. unpredictable yeah. limitations. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so the, the frequency range of those speakers uh, was uh, not work, was limiting the sound when it was played back sure. uh, in this uh, traditional, more more uh, uh, matrixed way. Yeah. And using those individual channels to play those, use them as a sections. Yeah. So actually, I, I use uh, stereo pairs as a section because I had stereo recording and that worked pretty well. So uh, the one thing that helped me also was that I could use the channel roping in sidewise. Right. Yeah. And that, that was very. Yeah. And that was the wise channel router plug-in where you're just yes. targeting very directly channels uh, that are yeah. attached to the computer using your Dante interface. Yeah, that's right. So this was pretty simple. I just needed to to uh, sometimes to copy uh, the tracks to another one so I can put it into another channel, but that was uh, 
working really well and then I just could uh, manage the volume of uh, different sections also using Quise. So actually I was using Quise as a, a mixing application yeah. for that. Yeah. Perfect. And it worked really, really well. So besides the, the, the mapping of the channels, there was also some uh, cases when we use the interactivity for the music, for example. So the, in the first scenario, the, the, the mountains, we had this intro played by uh, a fiddle. Fiddle. Yep. Yeah. So we had many versions of that uh, intro. And each time it was played back, you could uh, hear a different version. Right. Uh, so as you can see, this intro was in three, sec three phrases, three musical phrases. Mm -hmm. So each phrase was recorded in many variations. So each time it was uh, randomly chosen. So those you could multiply that nice and uh, see how many you have variations of that yeah that's great yeah so it worked really well especially for people that were uh, um, uh, the, the hosts of the exhibition because they heard this music all day long <laughs> yeah of course <laughs> so those variations for them were were uh, actually uh, life-saving yeah <laughs> It's run all day many uh -huh. times. <laughs> well, let's let's hear some of that if we can. Yeah, yeah, of course. So this is the. Okay, if I will play that again. There is some different version of, course. of the same. Yeah. So we had also some interactions. I don't know if the sound level is okay. Sounding great, okay. yeah. Oh, okay. So we had also some interactive sounds from at the beginning of the animation, for example, uh, yeah, I just switched to the the scenario. We have yeah, uh, so we have Giannis in the chat who is now reminded that they want to go to Tatra for the last half of the year. So okay, <laughs> great. great. It's evoking yeah. this uh, inspiration. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, Tatra mountains are great, but there are plenty tourists, so, <laughs> especially in the winter. So uh, look for the spots that are not so crowded. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, great. So okay. you've got the soundcaster up. Yeah, yeah. So this is the soundcaster for this scenario. So I could test some uh, interactions. For example, we had some kids that are waving to their parents. And if you would step on the sensor, they would say some like greetings. <laughs> And there was also a place where uh, you could see a mountaineer, so you could play some. It was wind. Great. Yeah. And different and, positioning uh, on that then, or would you? Yeah, yeah. The, the the sections of the screen were for different animations, so you could hear those sounds from those ah, great. speakers above those animations. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and that was the interactive part for the that composition. Uh, yeah, so there was also a, a helicopter from the mountain rescue team. So you could hear the sound of the helicopter. You can hear right now that the sound is spatialized because I'm using also the uh, spatialized system for that right yeah so i will show you just in a moment how uh, uh, you can hear different sections of the speakers uh, while i'm playing music for example uh, 
in this scenario when I play music. Let's let's hear it for a moment. Yeah. And I have the session in a Reaper when I have you can see this the channels from three to eight represent the speakers above the screens. Right. And one, two are the speakers for the the ring in the middle of the room. Got it. Because those twelve speakers were really just ended up being a stereo set of six and six. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. I I that that was all set and I couldn't uh, make it differently. So. So as you can hear, right, music for screens, and this is this middle section. Great. And we have brass here, and here are strings. Nice. So this music is not so, uh, th there are not so many instruments, so I use those simple sections that were different. And one thing that visually nicely uh, corresponded to this idea of using this ring section uh, in the middle for brass instruments, I will show you uh, on the slide. Uh, just let me turn it on. Because there was a... Oh, as you can see, there was this installation by Oskar Zienta. He is a Polish sculptor, or maybe he's not a sculptor, but he's a, a designer. So he created this special method uh, of uh, blowing air into the metal pieces. Yeah. So they, they become such as cushions, cool. metal cushions. And this is this installation from those metal cushions. And I, when I saw that, <laughs> I just thought, yeah, it looks like brass. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. It is, it is brass. Exact. So then you position the, the brass section from the, the yeah. inner ring there. And yeah. I, I wonder, did, did you perceive any kind of metallic resonance coming off those sculpture elements? Not, not really. Okay. But... Uh, perceptionally, yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it was like mind bending because you heard those brass instruments and you saw that these are the <laughs> those instruments, yeah, <laughs> yeah, playing in some abstract way represented in the this uh, center great. of this room, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Maybe it was only me, <laughs> but but it worked for me well, yeah. So. Um, but this was uh, much simpler uh, to arrange because we had the the string section was playing one certain melody, uh, the the cello section, and the corresponding section was the brass. But in the scenario uh, with the uh, changes, mm -hmm. it was much more complex. The, it was much more complex. As you can see, I was also ready to play those sections in a different way. Yeah. So this was in a sequence um, container. But let's play it through the soundcaster. <clears throat> yeah. And we can. I will show those sections how they work. So what you hear now is a binaural uh, simulation of the speaker system around you. And those two channels are, uh, that are stereo are just played as a stereo. Sure. Okay, so I will... You can hear this wood section, woodwind section on the right right now. And I can turn my head around. Yeah. Virtually. And let's hear what's in the middle. So we have some of the strings just to support those strings and percussions. Because in this scenario, 
I was looking at the sculpture and I thought also the drums, percussions also correspond to this, those objects. Yeah. They look like membranes or like sure. uh, drum heads, symbols. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. It's great. So after the introduction, there is this uh, heavy percussion section. Okay, and you can hear that some drums are in the middle. And brass, of course. Mm -hmm. And some are outside, so they correspond to each other. Nice. There are uh, two voices dialoguing. Right. Yeah. This is outside. And in the middle section. So there are moments when, when the center section is heavier and when the outside is heavier, right? So you can have the audience can feel the difference between when so closer to finale every section is pretty loud. And in the middle we have drums and harp. Nice. Yeah. Well, what an interesting way to balance it. You've got that outer ring and the inner ring that you're you're playing with. Uh, and of course, you have the different frequency responses of those speakers, yeah. as you mentioned. And so you're playing to the strengths of each set yeah. uh, of speakers. Yeah. And and the results are fantastic. Like, it's great to even in the in the simulation that you're running here. Uh, in stereo uh, with some binaural processing, it's effective. It's it's uh, it's really compelling to have that uh, distinction between the different parts of it. And I can only imagine navigating that space uh, because then you add in the reflections piece of it. Now, did you end up having to compensate for that at all, or because you were mixing in wise in the space with this uh, acousmatic, you know, abstraction, um, yeah. you're just kind of live compensating for anything that's yeah. coming up. Well, that, that helped a lot because if I would decode that from a uh, matrix system, uh, I guess uh, this was the problem that those reflections were canceling some frequencies. And when I spread out different sections separately, it started working uh, yeah. in this individual way. So there was no canceling. And it helped a lot to achieve wider frequency range, better dynamics, and more interesting. Uh, uh, th this walk through this room was more interesting in that way yeah. because you heard the changes from the sections and everything was, uh, it was like a choir and you would <laughs> walk through the choir. Yeah. So yeah, that, that helped a lot. And me being specialist in the spatial audio, my thinking was, yeah, I should uh, do it like I do it always with my typical approach. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> But it didn't seem to work well there. So I'm happy that I just got that idea how to manage it. And yeah, the results were fantastic because people that were uh, in the morning when they were listening to that, everyone was like, yeah, that's good. <laughs> cool. So I had already the audience there to judge my work and I was they were happy I was happy <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah that's great well and it's a, a testament to arriving with what you need through the process of good pre-production good communication setting expectations but then like the the secret weapon here is is your flexibility and your yeah, adaptation to the needs of that space 
that you know, and leveraging the experience that you have with spatial sound, really, ultimately. Yeah, well, uh, it helped a lot to not to stay with my uh, typical ways, but to find some alternative approach for that. Yeah. And having a knowledge from the lecture uh, regarding different aspects of music <laughs> yeah. was also a good uh, asset to use. Uh, yeah, so learn music, history of music, <laughs> <laughs> because you never know, you never know. Actually, I learned a lot when I was researching uh, spatial audio. I learned a lot about why, for example, some music was composed in a way that it was composed. Uh, for example, uh, Baroque music. Mm -hmm. Baroque music is composed for specific acoustics. Sure. So you, you can hear the what acoustics should be in the piece that you are playing just by how it's written by the composer. Sure. So if, if you have, for example, those uh, endings of phrases that are left to be heard by the uh, reverberation, yeah, it means that you should play it in a for example, uh, environment that has long reverberation, like church or chapel or something like that. Right, right. Oh so, yeah, you can you can hear that, you can see that actually in the in the score. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of things that you can uh, find if you are studying some subjects in a uh, way that you connect that knowledge with your other knowledge and look for the bridges or the links yeah. between them. It's really the idea of the space as another instrument, right? Or a contribution yeah. Yeah. to the yeah. composition and, and, and how that space can be championed to, to work with the composition in the best possible synthesis, right? Uh, yeah. And, and certainly that's what you've achieved with this, uh, Poland Expo presentation, right? It's the synthesis of all of these compositional techniques from both the composers working electronically and orchestrally, the composition inside of WISE using different interactive audio techniques, interactive music techniques, and then the flexibility of being able to route things to that room, to the way that it was designed and and then finally the real time mix of it uh, in the space without having to without having to go between a lot of different applications or change your workflow. It's yeah. all right there at your fingertips. Yeah, yeah, that was really convenient to have those tools. Routing is a very important tool when it comes to the spatial sound because. As when you are working with multiple speakers, you have to route your channels in a number of ways. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So yeah. This is crucial, and uh, having those tools to 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 mix that inside the interactive audio engine is really uh, important. As as you can see, there are many tracks here because. Yeah. Uh, some of them are copied like here to just to have a uh, possibility to uh, to route for example if this one goes to the uh, stereo section right and it copied also to channel number six yeah so to, to the one of the speakers on the outside right yeah so you know, as you can see there is is routing through different tracks, through different channels. Yeah, and really no rules. Like you said, you know, from a yeah. from a composition yeah. standpoint, it might not have made sense to to duplicate that part, um, you know, in the music, but in the space, and yeah. you know, to get the sound that you wanted, doubling that track and positioning it differently gave you the results that you were looking for yeah yeah and it was tailored by my ear so <laughs> yeah uh this is the way 
the best way to approach mixing, I guess, uh, not using just standard approach that this should be on the left, this should be on the right. Yeah. In this environment, there there are no rules, so you need to be flexible. Well said. As much as possible. Yeah. So uh, the interesting scenario with the um, ambience of the forest. Yeah. Uh, I, I can show you. I can great give you a listening uh, taste of that. <laughs> so we have this ambience, and here you have the uh, RTPC. Yeah, time of day. Which yeah, which we could control through the uh, web sockets also. So web sockets can send events and RTPCs. Great. I'm changing right now. Mm -hmm. So now it's night, full night. Yeah. <laughs> and I had a great uh, library of recordings done by uh, Polish academy um, technical academy uh, did ambisonic recordings in the uh, Białowieża forest which is the oldest forest in Poland and these were really nice quality and I could take some of that and do this uh, mix uh, in, that we use that's great. And what was the, how long did the day night cycle elapse? Well, it was short. Yeah. So, so there was no space to do very <laughs> uh, tangible changes. Yeah. It, it was like a very swift change. I can show you on a video actually. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, I had somewhere. Oh. I uh, maybe here. No, this is different. This is, this is something else. I will. I can show you this <laughs> also. But yeah. Uh, oh, maybe I don't have the video. Oh, uh, okay. I remember better now. The video was. I seen that on YouTube recorded by some visitor. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, there, there are lots of YouTube videos from the Polish pavilion because we had. One and one point five million visitors. Wow! During during the exhibition. Yeah, yeah. Moving so, <laughs> moving swiftly through there and uh, yeah, experiencing yeah. that. Uh, we're getting a lot of love in the chat from folks uh, around what folks are hearing. So thanks for giving the shout out there. Uh, it is sounding great, Brez. Jemek, it's uh, fantastic. I uh, love to hear that. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, uh, I wanted also to show the, uh, to give my respect to the composer uh, Mirt that did this uh, modular synth analog uh, piece. And I can show you the interactions and how the piece was Great. Uh, built. Uh, so, yeah, games was our code name for this scenario and as you can see yeah we are starting playing the game and actually this i received as a stereo piece so the routing was much easier the mixing uh, and because of the frequency range of those instruments it was sounding quite well it just disperse on this uh, system uh, quite evenly. So it is, as you can see here. Yep. Yeah, left, right, left, right, left, right. And it sounded quite well. So we had uh, uh, for those interactive sections, sounds uh, positioned. Yeah. Above those speakers around. Those ended up on the center ring of speakers? 
uh, those interactive sounds. Yeah. No, just above those sections where the people were playing. Ah, those great. Those, yeah, interactive zones were before the screens. Cool. Uh, yeah, so you could face the speaker and then you could hear if you hit or miss the object. Yeah. Right, because people are jumping back and forth between those interactive yeah. paths yeah. to try and um, yeah. 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 yeah, play the game. Yeah, yeah, and if you will finish the game, the game over section comes. Yeah, so this ends the loop, and we are going to the finale of the uh, scenario. Nice. So the music was really nice and it filled the space with different kind of mood per, uh, in relation to those uh, acoustic, more acoustic pieces. Right. So, so it was always nice to change from one mood to another and from the, uh, to the sounds of the forest ambience also. Yeah, I think it worked pretty well. It's got a great diversity across the different environments and experiences. And like you said, kind of stays fresh the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Both because of the different genres, but also because of the techniques that you're using, you know, uh, randomizing those different uh, solo instruments uh, for each repetition or the dynamics of the day and night cycle like these are all these are all tricks that we know well in game audio and yeah it makes sense leveraging that in the space in that dynamic environment uh, yes keeps it fresh one thing that I, I i really liked in this project was that uh, i was working with composers but i wasn't a composer myself for that piece so this was really <laughs> good thing because on many occasions you mix your own things yeah. and you don't have this fresh approach to that material and in that i was uh, uh relieved of the <laughs> yeah responsibility yeah and uh, it was really really nice to focus on uh, working on that sound without the uh the burden of being a composer right yourself so yeah right you could yeah. you could stay an interactive and spatial orchestrator right you you yeah. brought these yeah. performances into the interactive domain and position them in the space with the best representation divorced from the uh from the creation of that source material yeah so a uh, few interesting things uh, that we uh, learned from this project is that using this virtual environment to present the project to the client is something that you can use in different scenarios. Yeah. Uh, the, my friend that was doing this uh, animation, Maciej Digowski from company Creative Planet, uh, they create videos for the dome projections mm -hmm. or half dome projections. Right. And you, we don't think about that, but it's difficult to present that to the client if you don't have actual dome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How do you show that? <sighs> so using this approach that you virtualize that and you put that, for example, in a special application in your headset, yeah. send that to client, he can see the thing as he would be in the dome. Yeah. Right. So uh, I think there is a plenty of uh, possibilities to use that. Yeah. Uh, not only to design games, but game engines are really fantastic uh, environments to create all sorts of uh, audiovisual uh, devices. So as you said, uh, for me, it's a space for uh, bringing music instruments that you don't uh, you you don't find in the real world. Yeah, you can bring those into life in uh, in such environments and having a great sound engine 
to uh, support that is also in important. Yeah. Well, and, and what you're saying is really just bridging that communication gap, right? It's, it's that you're using the technology to help keep people informed about, in this case, the project, right? And, and these tools that we have, game engines, audio engines, techniques, you know, they, they bring us closer to that collaboration, whether we're talking about a game that's being worked on remotely by a, a group of people uh, or an experience like this where the preparation that you do up front, you know, arrives on site with that ability to, to really execute uh, during that short window of opportunity to create this environment and immersive experience in person. But these tools that we use to help facilitate that communication, right? I mean, as we are right now, but also extending that because, yeah, how do you give someone the impression of uh, a real, of a dome, of yeah. this environment, right? And, and help to align those expectations about what the results will be when you do eventually arrive in person. Uh, so it's smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had this moment in my life when I was actively working uh, with sound installations. Yeah, we built from the actual speakers, so it involved a lot of carrying heavy stuff, <laughs> cables, yeah, everything. And when I started working with VR, I just found out that I can do it. All the things I can do virtually, and they will work. Uh, really well so maybe there's not uh, there's no need to 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 carry heavy things anymore yeah maybe yeah, of course we can carry yeah. it one time yeah. at the end but not all the other times yeah yeah of course you can you can design your uh, installation you can test yeah. your installation yeah, yeah. Because when, when you're working with the location-based uh, installations like that one in Dubai, the most important thing is user experience. Yeah. So designing that is a really a challenge. Yeah. Because you don't know how people will re react, for example, to do. And the react, of course, there were many surprises for us yeah. when we saw how people behave in the space. Yeah. And we anticipated something different, for example. <laughs> yeah. And of course, people from different cultures act differently also. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So the uh, testing is a key to, to find out what will happen. Yeah. Because you can then, uh, when the design is not working well, you end up with some signs you should do that. Right. Or press yeah. that. To, press here tutorializing yeah. the experience uh, yeah yeah uh, it, and this is something you don't want to have no it makes me imagine like kids running in a circle or, around the the interactive zones you know just endlessly yeah. in a circle constantly triggering yeah. things like maybe not something you would anticipate but uh but boy that would be fun to hear <laughs> uh, well well typical uh typical thing that happened was that people stood in the spot oh. and didn't go out sure. and try that because they thought that this is the place to stand ah, and to listen. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Uh, Eduardo from the, uh, from the chat is, uh, is plussing up this idea that, uh, you know, bringing a, a visual and audio aspect as a demonstration to help clients understand in advance what's happening, uh, you know, can be way more effective than explaining it abstractly with words for an hour. And, and I think this idea yeah, of yeah. show, don't tell in that experience is super valuable. Thanks, Eduardo. Yeah. It, Greetings, Eduardo. He knows a lot about it. Ha, <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. So it's, uh, but you can't uh, you can't know everything, and staying flexible to what happens when you arrive, um, and even after the fact, if you were to do it again, like taking your experience, and that's something that that I see in your career that you've continued to to carry forward is 
your experiences with sound, with interactivity, and and space, and how that yeah. just arrives uh, for this project at least uh, at the best possible uh, intersection of all of your interests. So, thanks so much for sharing all of that with us today. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. It's a great talk. I really uh, appreciated that perspective on it. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to talk about that. And I'm uh, really happy to that I gather all this in one video that I can share with my students. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be a great material for them. <laughs> well, and great material for our community out there, uh, working with WISE and working in spaces to create these very interesting ways to bridge the gap between people, uh, bringing people into uh, another way and another culture's experiences, I think really helps, uh, yeah, helps us connect uh, during times when we can't or in ways that we can't necessarily. So it's great work to be doing. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Any last thoughts? Well, I'm happy to be with the, uh, the kinetic community. And now I'm serving as a certified trainer. So I'm happy to be even more <laughs> in this community. So yeah, great. Happy to be here. Great. And sure. Great to have you out there. And again, uh, you know, masterful use of the technology and all of these elements arriving in time for your creation. So it's a gift uh, to be here and to have your experience on Wise Up On Air. Thanks to folks who tuned in uh, in the chat. Great to have you here. And uh, if you're out there working with Wise, uh, and interactive audio, keep reaching for those cool things to do in the world. So, Jemek, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Damian. All right. And so, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> it's been great. So, take care until next time. Uh, this is Wise Up on Air. Thanks. Thank you very much.